Welcome everyone to the Public Professor Series uh, five question virtual interview. Uh, and today we're with Dr. David Loeb. Uh, thank you for joining us. And this is organized by the University of Lethbridge. So before we begin, I'd like to uh, give a proper land acknowledgement. Okay, and welcome to the University of Lethbridge. Our university's Blackfoot name is Iniskin, meaning sacred buffalo stone. The university is located in traditional Blackfoot Confederacy territory. We honor the Blackfoot people and their traditional ways of knowing and caring for this land, as well as all Abor Aboriginal people who have helped shape and continue to strengthen our university community. Thank you. And in light of recent events also, I feel it's appropriate to include a second acknowledgement. Um, so uh, let's take a second to acknowledge and pay respects to all the people of color in the States and in Canada whose lives were taken as a result of police brutality and greater systemic racism. Don't let their lives be lost without cause. There are many ways we can learn from this chapter of history. So after this talk is over, I'd encourage you to take a moment of silence and reflect and pay respect to uh, the innocent lives lost. I'd also encourage everyone to continue these conversations we've been having in your immediate community and in society at large. Thank you for taking any action at all towards changing these systemic issues. And thank you for your time and efforts in acknowledging the lives of all people. And not to mention, I think it's also Pride Month. So there's a bunch of like virtual pride events happening globally. You should check it out online on Facebook and, and everywhere. And who is this person? Who's been talking to you for the past couple minutes? My name is Uriel. Uh, I am a ULETH alumni. That feels weird to say. And a ULETH TEDx speaker. You can check out my TEDx talk online also at TEDx.com. That's a shameless plug, I know. Um, this is not about me though. This is about Dr. David Loeb. Uh, I first got to meet David Logue, Dr. Logue, in class when he taught behavior and evolution. And then flash forward two years later, we sat down, uh, we sat down for an interview. He uh, came onto my radio show, The Eclectic, which was nominated for the National Community Radio Award. And you can also check out The Eclectic online. It's a podcast. And uh, the many interactions we've had over the years have been delightful. Dr. Logue is an exceptional individual, genuine patient and a caring instructor. Uh, th that's a widely held sentiment I'm sure shared with his many former students. Um, I actually have a, a best regards message from a former student of yours, Dr. Logue. Um, I was thrilled to have another opportunity to talk about his research today, so Without any further ado, I'll introduce Dr. David Logue. He's an associate professor and chair in the Department of Psychology uh, and an associate member uh, of the biology department at the University of Lethbridge, where he teaches animal communication, animal behavior, acoustic analysis, plenty more. Uh, he's our residential specialist in these topics. Uh, also, vocal communication, avian ecology, and evolution of behavior. You can find out more about all of his research by visiting his website, david-logue, D-A-V-I-D, dash L-O-G-U-E, dot squarespace, dot com, where you can see pictures and listen to recordings of Adelaide warblers taken from the field sites in Puerto Rico. Dr. Logue is famously known for his contributions and vocal interactions between sedentary pair-bonded birds, including the skillfully named Duet Code. That could also be the title of your movie when it comes out, Dr. Logue. And theories regarding the function of song type matching. We'll get to know more about these theories and findings with the coming questions, so stay tuned. On our last interview over the radio, we marveled at his versatile skill set, being talented at weightlifting competitively, not only listening to music, but jamming out to music. He plays the bass guitar. And with all the things that I got to know of David Logue, I prepared a little poem to get us into question number one. Are you ready to hear my poem? Okay. When he began, but a young lad from California, obsessed with the outdoors, a talented David scours the texts to find a captivating place to settle his nest. There, 
he set his gaze on a field wide open and filled with potential. Go forward in the direction of uncertainty, where you will be met with a curious call, one you might not understand immediately, but you'll come to know in its entirety. So tell us about this curious call, Dr. Logue. Tell us how you got into studying birdsong and are you fluent yet in this language of the bird? Thanks. That was, that was fantastic, man. That is, uh, that is the best introduction I've ever had. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, thank you for agreeing to do this, Uriel. Uh, I'm really happy that, that we're able to do this together. I enjoy being on your show a lot and I thought you'd be the perfect person to do this interview. So I really appreciate your agreeing to do that. And also thanks to Catherine Reeder we set this all up. Um, it's a great idea to do this uh, while we're all on lockdown and, uh, and you've been fantastic to work with. So thanks a lot, Catherine. Uh, how did I get into studying birdsong? Well, I really, my, my interest was really in biology and specifically in sort of what animals do. I always had this idea that animals had this kind of secret life, that they did all this stuff that we couldn't understand. And I wanted to understand it better. I, uh, I grew up in the country in Northern California. And my favorite things to do outside were to turn over rocks and logs and boards and look for snakes and lizards, things like that, frogs, whatever. I'd take them and I'd put them in a little jar. I'd try to make a nice little life for them. I'd try to give them plants and stuff so they were happy and try to give them food. And I'd just watch them. And, I just had this idea that they had this some sort of life, like they had a life and they had a mind and it wasn't like mine, but it was something and I didn't know what it was. And I wanted to know what it was. I was very interested in what's the experience of this snake and what are like, what are the secrets? What are the things that we don't know? Cause there must be a lot going on that we don't know. That we can't tell. And I wanted to know about that. So between like catching snakes and lizards and watching documentaries on PBS. My dad and I used to watch these documentaries and I just I just loved the idea of, of the jungle and going to the jungle and seeing all these interesting animals and then trying to like understand them, you know, like almost like being like a psychologist for animals, like trying to understand what was happening in the animal mind. That was something that for whatever reason, just from a very early age, it just it fascinated me. Um, I thought animals were beautiful. I liked them and I like wanted to be around them. And then I just wanted to know what they were doing and what they were thinking. And so that was kind of my obsession all through grade school, probably even into middle school. But then high school happened and I don't know, I kind of, in a way I kind of lost my way, I guess. Like high school was good for me, but um, I was really interested in music. You were saying I play music. I just became really interested in playing in this band. And then it was like, okay, well, I'm gonna go to college, go to university, right? I'm gonna go to university. And then I'm gonna to have to have a job. So I'm good at biology, so I'll be like a I'll be a physician. I was thinking I'd go to medical school. Cause it just seemed it just seemed like a thing you could do. You know, it was almost like the path that was sort of like the obvious path, you know, the wide path. And so I go to university and whatever, I'm pulling bees. I I am in a pretty good school. I'm at the University of California. And I'm getting bees and I never I never really applied myself all that much. I never really tried all that hard. I was able to do okay in school without without really applying myself to, to sort of the full degree. Um, but just okay, you know, not exceptional, but I was fine with that. That was okay with me at the time. And then after my freshman year, after my first year of university, I, I was spending the summer living with a friend and, and I got in all this trouble with my parents. They didn't like what I was doing at university. They didn't like the lifestyle that I was leading. And they said, okay, <laughs> you're cut off. They cut me off. I didn't have any, any more financial support from my parents, I had to drop out of school, actually. I had to take a year off. I had to apply for you know, loans and scholarships and stuff so I get back into school. And during that time, I actually remember the moment. I was walking on a road. I was thinking about how I used to walk home from school and I used to look for tadpoles and frogs in the, in the gutter, like the, the drainage ditches on the side of the road. I was walking on this road and thinking about that. And it was just this like moment where I, I was thinking, I need to do what I'm good at. I didn't like the, the hourly job that I was working. It was a terrible job. It was dangerous. I wasn't getting paid very much. I didn't like being poor all the time. Um, and, I, and I just sort of had this, 
realization that I needed to choose a job. I needed to pursue something that I would actually like doing that was, that I was good at and that I liked doing, you know, like, and, and I feel fortunate because there's something that I was good at and there was something that I liked doing, but for some reason I'd sort of set that aside as like uh, maybe unrealistic or maybe just, you know, got caught up in this idea that I wanted to do something like be a physician or, or be a professional musician or something that would maybe earn me a little more status or something. So anyway, I went back to school and I just had a whole different attitude. I just, I was really immersed myself in school, studied all the time. I mean, I partied too. I had friends, we did stuff, but during the day, you know, between classes, after a class would end, I'd go to this cafe and I'd open my books and I'd just be working on that for hours, you know? And then after school, I'd go to a, a restaurant or something and I'd eat a burrito. And while I was eating my burrito, I'd be studying. And then afterwards, if I didn't have anything to do, I'd go home or go to a cafe and I'd study. So it was just like, it was just like, became part of my life where I was just constantly trying to learn and constantly trying to understand what was happening in my classes. And, and it worked out super well. I, uh, I, I was really like driven in my classes. I was learning a ton. I loved what I was learning. And I was really fortunate to be at the University of California, San Diego, because we have some really exceptional professors in animal behavior and in animal communication. And I was just drinking it in. This was, I felt like I'd finally found what it was that I needed to learn. Up until that point, it had been all these intro classes with chemistry and calculus. And, you know, it didn't, I didn't feel like it was speaking to me because it wasn't what I was excited about. But then I started learning about how animals communicate with each other. And I just, it was like, this is it. You know, I can understand the physics of it. I can understand the, the sort of mathematics behind it. Um, but, but it's the fact that the animals are doing it and that it's about the natural world that made it interesting to me and compelling to me. And so I had a chance to, to go to a field course in Costa Rica. I finally got to go to the tropical forest and it was even, it was even more amazing than I had imagined it. I mean, the first time I remember we were walking into the forest, you could hear these monkeys, you hear the howling monkeys in the trees and there were the big giant canopy trees all on both sides and it just started pouring rain. And I remember I just like, I took my shirt off and it was just like, it was like I was being baptized, you know, I was just so happy to be there. And every minute in the forest was just like, holy, I just, I loved it so much. I really felt like I found what I wanted to do. And so, you know, I do that experience. I had a wonderful time. I felt like I, I really, I was really doing the right thing doing that. I go back to school and, and, you know, just getting A's, just, just studying all the time and, and really like doing well in my classes, kind of, kind of for the first time, like definitely for the first time at the university level. But the first time I was like, I'm going to give hundred percent and see what happens. And what happened was it was working out really well. And so I decided I wanted to go do a PhD, but I didn't understand anything. I finished my undergraduate fast. I finished in three years, right? And, and I hadn't, didn't have any research experience and have any personal connections uh, really to speak of. And so I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And, and through a very small amount of research, I came up with this idea that, that there was somebody that studied animal communication at Colorado State University. I had been to Colorado before, I liked it. So I applied there really like seriously on the basis of the fact that Colorado seemed like a nice place to go. Um, and so that was a foolish way to make the decision, but it turned out great because uh, I ended up going there and, and my supervisor, Mike Baker, is just a, just a wonderful guy, like kind of like a second father to me, really shepherded me through the PhD program and, and gave me just the kind of guidance and encouragement that I needed. You know, we were like, we were like a great match, you know, because that, that supervisor student relationship is, is kind of like a marriage, right? You really have to, it's really about the chemistry between the two of you. Can the supervisor give the student what the student needs? Can the student communicate with the supervisor in a way that's, you know, gonna, gonna be productive? And, uh, and we had, we're just a great match. And, uh, and he was the one that actually turned me on to duetting, which is what I would go on to study for my PhD kind of indirectly. I had uh, I'd come there, I'd come to Colorado, I met Mike, and he said, what do you want to study? And I said, I don't know, I want to study something in the tropics. And, and he gave me a book, and there was a chapter in the book, it was called something like Vocal Communication in Tropical Birds, The Urgency and the Opportunity. And it was for this chapter was trying to make the case that there's a bunch that we need to learn about vocalizations in tropical birds. So I read this chapter, and I went back to Mike, and I was like, Mike, this part right here about duetting in birds, this is great. So the story is, is that the male and the female bird, they sing together, like back and forth. 
can play one right here. Here's one. So what you heard is actually two birds. That's two birds singing back and forth with each other. And this idea that, that the mated couple sang with each other, I thought it was very romantic. I thought it was very sweet. And then the fact that we didn't understand why they did it, really didn't understand. We didn't, you know, there were a few ideas, but there's really no clear evidence about why the birds were doing this. It was exactly the kind of mystery about sort of the inner experiences, the inner lives of these animals that, that was really attractive to me. And that was the kind of thing that I wanted to learn about. Plus I was gonna get to be able to go work in the tropics, you know, work in the jungle, which is where I wanted to be. So, so we had this like beautiful, you know, music. And as a musician, I'm like, this is wonderful stuff. This idea that the male and female are working together, which I thought was really interesting. And then the chance to go to the jungle and solve a mystery. You know, I mean, the truth is I, I had like, you know, a green shirt and like a machete and like tough pants and boots and all this stuff. I, I kind of wanted to be, you know, like an adventurer down in the forest and, and, and go, you know, go extract knowledge from the jungle. And, and that's what I did, you know, and then I went down and I did my, my PhD work um, at the Smithsonian in Panama. And I spent a few, a few field seasons uh, in Panama, four field seasons, I guess, in Panama. Um, trekking around in the jungle, um, trying to figure out what these birds were doing. Well, thank you for that comprehensive answer to the first question, Dr. Logue. What are some interesting things you've learned about the birds you study? Man, there's so much stuff. It's honestly the experience of spending a field season studying a particular population of a particular species of animals. You just get to know so much about them. You even get to know things about individuals. I get to know what an individual bird is like. And that's the, it's, it's such a crazy thing because we see these birds and they seem like, to me at least, they seem like these very transient things. So you can kind of imagine, you know, you see a little bird, you see another little bird and they're all kind of interchangeable and they're just a bunch of birds out there and they're kind of anonymous and they go on and they sort of enter your life and then they leave your life and it's this very transient experience. But when you're studying the birds, you, you put uh, little plastic bands around their legs uh, and each individual has a different set of plastic bands. So one might be like red, blue, yellow, green. And another one might be like red, red, light blue, light blue, something like that. And so when you look at them through binoculars, you can identify individuals. And then once you can do that, you can start to see how each individual is different. They've all got their own little place where they live. They've all got their own little tendencies. Some of them sing more, some of them sing less. They've got different songs that they sing. And so to start to see them as individuals, and then to start to see their little dramas unfold. Like there was this one guy and in 2017, we went down there and for whatever reason, he was solo, he didn't have a partner. So he was an unmated male and his territory was so small that by the end of the season, he kept losing territory, losing territory, losing territory. By the end of the season, he only had one tree left. And there were, there were all these other birds that had like a hectare territory all around him. And this one bird had one tree left and so my student named him Bambi because he thought he was very meek and very shy, like he was like a little baby. And so Bambi, we all thought Bambi would be dead the next year. But we came back in 2018 and Bambi had like expanded his empire. He pushed out, he got a girlfriend, he pushed out on both sides and now he has this big territory and he goes all around this big territory and he sings him and his mate. And so you get, you start to see these, once you can see them as individuals, you can start to understand their individual stories. And that's something that, I don't even, I don't even know if I, I thought about that, you know, before I was able to do that. Um, this idea that, that every one of them is different and that they all have these life stories and they're not, you know, they don't, they don't go get jobs and get married and do all the stuff that we do, but, but they have a, a course of development, you know, their life changes over time and different individuals are different from each other. And that was a really cool thing to learn. What a great way to put it. I love the whole, you know, um, liking birds to, to humans and that they also have a life uh, different than ours in many ways, but still uh, a life nonetheless that we don't get to see. But it's beautiful that you get to see that yourself, Dr. Loke. Um, third question. Could you explain to us what is the duet code? Thanks. Yeah, no, I'd love to. Um, so the duet code is just a term that I made up to describe um, something that I discovered during my PhD. So I'll, I'll, maybe I'll tell the story of kind of how I discovered it and that'll lead into explaining kind of what it is. So when birds duet, 
the male and the female sing back and forth with each other. And in most of these birds, and in most birds generally, most songbirds at least, each individual can sing lots of different songs. So a bird could sing like, and it could also sing, and a bunch of other ones. We have like 30 different song types in its repertoire. So the repertoire is the set of songs it can sing. So this bird that I was studying, the black-bellied wren, would be a little different than most birds up here in Canada, because most Canadian songbirds, only the male sings. If the female sings, she does so rarely. In tropical birds, southern hemisphere birds, you have a lot where both sexes sing, the male sings and the female sings. And this particular species, in the black-bellied wren, both the male and the female have repertoires of song types. So the female can sing about 15, 20 different types, and the male can sing about 30 different types. And when they put them together to form a duet, where they sing back and forth with each other, they don't just slap together two random songs. It was clear from just listening to them and, and looking at recordings of their duets, that particular male songs went with particular female songs. And people have known that for a long time. That's true of duetting birds generally. When they duet, they don't just slap together songs at random. There are certain male songs that go with certain female songs to form duets. And so I was interested in the idea of, of how they did that. And I sort of had that in the back of my head, like, where does this come from? What are the individuals doing to put these songs together to make these coordinated duets? And so one day, I was, one night actually, one night I was working uh, in this little office, kind of like almost like a little like, tiny like broom closet that we had at Colorado State. So I was at Colorado State and there's this tiny little room and it had a computer and a desk in it. And I was working late at night. I liked to work in there because it was quiet and isolated. And I had all the time in the world because I was a graduate student. So I was working late at night. And what I was doing is I was transcribing data from an experiment that I'd done. I'd done this experiment and, and I recorded it. You record it onto, at the time we were recording them onto audio cassettes. It tells you that it was a while ago. I recorded it onto audio cassettes. And then we listened to the audio cassette and I would mark down on a little transparency all of the events on a timeline. So I'd have this timeline, they'd say how time was going, and I'd mark down, oh, the male sang, oh, the female sang, da 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 One of the things that I was scoring was song type switching. So when the male was singing one song type, and then he switched to another one, I'd make a special mark. So I was listening to this recording, and I saw the male song switched, so I marked, you know, switch, and then right after that, his mate switched her song type. I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. Okay, whatever. So I marked that down. And then it happened again right afterwards. The male switched and then the female switched. I was like, that's strange, man. I wonder, I wonder if there's something to that. So I start filing through all my old transparencies. I'd, I'd done about half the experiment at that point. So I had a good stack of you know 20 or whatever transparencies to look over. And it dawned on me that every time the male switched song type, the female switched right afterward. I felt kind of foolish for not having recognized that before because it was a very strong pattern. It was, it was pretty much an every time thing. And so I started thinking about it and I started to get very excited because it gave me an idea about how I was going to answer this question of how the male and the female put their song types together. So I had this idea, which in science is called a hypothesis. I had this hypothesis that what happens is, is that the female listens to her mate. And for each song that he sings, she's got a particular song that she uses as a response so that when he switches song types, she needs to switch to give the appropriate response. And so what the duet code is, is the name for that relationship between the songs that she hears and the songs that she sings. If she has a duet code, that means that she's got a set of rules that links the song types that she hears to the song types that she uses as a response. And so what I ended up doing was I went back into the field the next year and, and I tested this hypothesis with an experiment in which I pretended to be the male bird. So I got the birds real excited by doing a bunch of song playbacks on their territory. And they thought there was an intruding pair and they were really aggressive. And the female starts answering, answering, answering. Every time the male sings, she answers them. But then I switched to a different speaker and I started playing back the male's own songs. But I was able to do it in random order, right? So I was playing back the male's own songs and the female, she thought that that was actually her mate singing. And so she answered it to form duets over and over. And so it's a really beautiful essay because I could just ask her, okay, what's the answer to this song? What's the answer to this song? What's the answer to this song? And I could fill out her whole duet code there. And I could test how closely she adhered to the code, 
I could test, and, and very closely is the answer, like 100% almost. I could test uh, whether different females had the same codes. It turns out they don't. Every female has a different set of rules. I could test if the codes persisted from year to year. They do. Uh, the codes are, are quite stable year upon year. So that was the work that I did with the duet code. But then a woman named Carla Rivera Cáceres at the University of Miami several years later took my research and followed up on it. She had her own closely related species that she was working on. And she showed that the kids, the babies, actually learn the codes from their parents. They listen to their parents duetting and they learn and copy their code. And then when they go off and fledge and meet a partner, then the partners learn each other's codes and start to use those. So there's a bunch of stuff that I think is cool about this. I mean, I just think it's, it's, it's nifty and it's exciting and it's interesting. It tells us something about the natural world. But I think that there's a, maybe an application to, to humans here too, in that for a long time, we have used songbird song learning as a model for word learning in human beings. Um, songbirds learn their songs much like we learn our words. And most of the research that we do on bird song not my lab, but, but other labs, most of the research that's conducted on birdsong is actually about using songbirds as a model for human word learning. So where in the brain does it occur? What time of life does it occur? What are the neurotransmitters involved? And so on and so forth to understand vocal learning. Now here we have a system where the birds don't just learn the signals, they actually learn the rules that connect the signals to each other. And we do that too, right? We have grammar, we have rules, that govern conversation. So my hope is that this duet code system can become a model for understanding what's called vocal pragmatics, the rules that structure our vocal communication. Since we're on the topic of um, language development, both in birds and in humans, uh, I'd like to ask if you could expand on what you were just saying, uh, what is the application of uh, studying bird song and duet code and uh, song type matching in uh, studying human language development? Thanks, that's a good question. And, and this is something that um, has provoked a great deal of interest in the bird song community. Um, as I alluded to before, most workers in bird song are actually addressing this question. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of a weirdo in the sense that I'm actually primarily interested in how birds communicate with each other. Uh, there's you know dozens of labs that study that, but there's probably more labs that, that do what you're talking about, trying to understand vocal learning in birds as a model of vocal learning in human beings. And it's a really, really, really good model. Um, you can think about it in terms of just sort of the gross timing of development. Um, most birds, have a sensitive period where they are most able to learn their new songs, just like humans have a sensitive period where they're best able to learn language. So there's a special what's called plasticity or malleability in the, the vocal learning centers in both humans and birds. So scientists are able to study how that happens. How does that develop? Why does it go away? What are the genes, for example, that are involved in turning that on and off? Uh, also, when we think about language development in human beings, humans are exposed to tons of sounds, right? We're exposed to bird songs and barking dogs and falling trees and the wind, but we actually learn to mimic other human language. Now that kind of seems obvious if you just say it because everybody does it, but it's not that obvious, right? Why, why do we know, why does the baby know to listen to the human signals and copy those instead of the dog barks or the, or, the, or the birds in the trees and copy those, right? And birds are the same way. They have some kind of what we call a template. So sort of like a, a set of rules that limits what kind of stimulus they're going to learn. So if you expose a bird to the song of the wrong species, in many cases, it won't even learn it. And if it does, it won't do a very good job of copying it. And if you expose them to, to the proper species and a bunch of other species, it usually does a really good job of only learning the song of the correct species. So both humans and birds have this kind of a template phenomenon. And of course, people study how that works and what are sort of the mechanistic underpinnings of it. How does it work at the neural level? How does it work at the hormonal level? Things like that. Another really important analogy between birds and humans uh, when it comes to vocal learning is how the brain is arranged for vocal learning. So you can kind of imagine 
on the one hand, that it's possible that our brain is just a really sort of homogenous unit and that learning is distributed all over the brain. That's actually not true. In both birds and in humans, there are specific parts of the brain that are specialized for vocal learning and for vocal production. So we can learn about those in great detail in birds in ways that we just can't in human beings. And a lot of that is, is really about ethics. Uh, if you think about it, um, one way to understand what a part of the brain does is to stop it from doing that thing. That's called an ablation experiment. So in birds, if we're studying uh, vocal learning in birds, scientists could destroy a small area of the brain or inhibit a small area of the brain and see how learning progresses. We can change the uh, social environment of the bird by giving it different kinds of tutors to learn from. Right? These are things that we just couldn't do in human beings. So we can use birds to do experiments that would be impossible in human beings. And, and again, the metaphor goes to every level that we look at it. So whether we're talking about the developmental trajectory, the growth structure, or even the specific genes that are involved. A great example is this gene FOXP2. It's the most famous gene in vocal learning. And FOXP2 occurs in both songbirds and in human beings. And it's critical in vocal learning in both of them. If we have a mutated FOXP2, it, reduce, it results in, in all kinds of deficits, including a significant language deficit. And the same is true for birds. I actually have a colleague now who works in parrots that's actually working on turning on and off FOXP2 in living birds to see how it affects their vocal learning. And he's finding some really strong results. Thank you for that. And uh, last question, since you've laid down quite a bit of uh, groundwork in terms of explaining how um, these birds communicate with each other, could you explain to me the general consensus and your theory on song type matching? Uh, with pleasure. So song type matching occurs when one bird sings a song and then a different bird sings the same song type right afterward. So I'm not necessarily talking about duetting birds right now. So we can kind of take all that idea and just set it to the side. This is a different kind of vocal interaction and it mostly occurs between different territory owners. Okay, so it's been studied almost exclusively in male birds because again, in the Northern hemisphere where most of the researchers are, it's the male birds that sing. So there's a real strong research bias toward male birds. It's, we're working on that. There's a lot more research on female bird song happening now. And in fact, there's kind of a, almost a political movement within our discipline uh, promoting research on female bird song. But what we know about song type matching is pretty much exclusively from males. So I'm gonna stick to that for now. So you've got a male on his territory and he's singing, and there's this male on another territory and he's singing. And our first guy sings one song type and then the second guy replies with the exact same song type. We've had a song type match. Birds do this a lot, it's pretty conspicuous. Lots of different species do it. Why do they do it? Okay, obviously it's possible that it's just a coincidence, right? Sometimes a bird's gonna sing one song, the bird's gonna sing the same song. We can rule that out. They do it too much, it's too context specific. It really occurs in certain behavioral contexts often associated with aggression. And, and so nobody in our field believes that this just happens on accident. They're doing something. What are they doing? Behavioral ecologists are very interested in male-male aggression. Male-male aggression is very easy to understand from a Darwinian perspective, and it's been a really important framework for understanding a lot of animal behavior, including signaling behavior. And so the prevailing idea historically has been that song type matching is a signal of aggressive intent. It's a way for a bird to signal to another bird that it doesn't like what that other bird is doing. Maybe it's too close to the territory border. And if it doesn't change, if it doesn't stop singing or go further away, there could be an aggressive escalation. So I song type match you, and that tells you that if you don't change what you're doing, I might come over and we might get into a fight. So it's, it's, like, it's like a growling dog, essentially. But the cool thing about matching is that from like a, a function and structure perspective, how we'd express it in biology, a cool thing about matching is, is that it's inherently directional. So if there's all these different birds singing, and then you sing, and then I sing, you know I'm talking to you, right? All these other birds are singing different songs. I'm able to direct my signal to you. So that's why it's kind of an elegant explanation as a signal of aggression. Problem is, is that when we look for an association between song type matching and subsequent aggressive escalation, it's just not there. There's been a ton of studies 
really nice studies, really good studies with designs that are really effective at demonstrating aggressive intent in other classes of signals. And they have not been able to show that song type matching qualifies as a signal of aggressive intent. Um, to put it simply, after a bird song type matches, it's no more likely to attack than if it didn't song type match. So I really don't have evidence to support this prevailing hypothesis that it's a signal of aggressive intent. So I had this other idea. I had this other idea um, that I call the structural alignability hypothesis. So I'm gonna take a little bit of a sidetrack to talk about um, structural alignability and then we'll get back into bird songs. The idea, at least in this phrasing, calling it structural alignability, there's, there's other words that can be used to describe this, but the structural alignability idea came from consumer psychology. So there were consumer psychologists who were interested in understanding how to present products to people in ways that would make them want to buy them. And they do a bunch of good work. They're, they're well-funded, as you might imagine. So what these consumer psychologists came up with is this idea that if somebody's trying to choose between two different things, two different entities, like two cars they might buy or two cell phone plans they might purchase, the similarities between those things are irrelevant. Right? I've got two cars, a Honda and a Toyota. I'm going to choose one of them. If I told you they both have four wheels, that does not help me choose one of them, right? They both have that thing, so it doesn't tip the scales in favor of one or the other. So when we make a decision between two things, we're interested not in their similarities, but in their differences. And then these theorists suggest, okay, for the purpose of this kind of a discussion, we're not just interested in one kind of difference, we're interested in two different kinds of differences, alignable differences and non-alignable differences. Alignable differences, are differences between structures that are shared by both entities. So let's go back to the car again. You want to buy a car, you've narrowed it down to two cars, a Honda and a Toyota. Let's say they're identical in every way, except that the Honda gets 40 miles to the gallon and the Toyota gets 35 miles to the gallon. Both of them have a fuel economy, but the Honda's fuel economy is better. That should be a very easy decision to make. It is an easy decision to make. You want the Honda. They're the same in every way, but the Honda's got better fuel economy, easy decision. You could make it very quickly, you'd feel very confident that it was a good decision, and you'd be right. Now, let's take a different scenario. Now we're gonna talk about non-alignable differences. Non-alignable differences are differences that cannot be mapped on to a common structure in both of the entities that you're comparing. So now, let's say you've got two cars, a Honda and a Toyota, and they're identical in every way, except the Honda has a heads-up display, and the Toyota has an extended warranty. Which one's better? Well, it's gonna take you a while to figure that out, right? You're gonna to have to think about it. What you're actually probably gonna do, if you're like most people, is you're gonna to try to translate those differences into some common variable, like how much value it has to you, how much money it's worth, how much happiness it's gonna bring you, something like that. And that's gonna take time and effort, which, which animals and humans don't like giving if they can help it. And it's also going to result in a less precise answer. You're more likely to be wrong, right? Because that act of converting in your mind from, let's say, a heads up display to dollars or to how much happiness it's going to be, there's going to be some error in that conversion. So you're less likely to make the right decision. So now we're going to go back to birds. Some bird just sang a song. Okay, just saying this song. And I have that song in my repertoire too. And now I'm gonna choose, do I wanna match that song or not? According to our hypothesis about song type matching, and it's, I say our not as the royal we, but as me and my co-author, Wolfgang Forstmeyer, who I wrote this paper with. According to our hypothesis, if I match that song, it's gonna be very easy for everyone else who's listening, maybe females who are thinking about mates, maybe other males who are interested in understanding who are the dominant males in this population. It's gonna be very easy for them to compare the quality of those songs if I've done a song type match. So I'm gonna make it obvious to everyone who is the better singer if I do a song type match. And that's exactly what I should do if I think I'm the better singer. But suppose this other bird has sung a song, it's in my repertoire. I could choose to match it if I wanted to, but I'm thinking he's a much better singer than me. If I match that song type, I will unambiguously expose myself as the inferior singer 
to all of the eavesdroppers who are listening right now. So all the females that are listening, that are thinking about who they might want to mate with, all the males that are listening, who are thinking about who's the dominant male in the population. If I expose myself by singing the same song type, they're all going to know that I'm the worst male. So instead, what I should do is make it as difficult a comparison as possible and sing a different song type. Okay, so this is, this is our hypothesis. And it basically says that song type matching is a way to make it easy to compare song types. And a key prediction of that hypothesis is that males should only do that if clarifying the comparison is going to be advantageous to them. So they should only match if they can sing better than the other male. Now, I'm going to do one, one more little statement about this, which is in reference to what makes a better song or a worse song. Okay, we haven't talked about that at all yet, um, but there is a bunch of research on that. That's something that my lab is very interested in and has done quite a bit of work on. And to, to give you a really short answer, it's mostly about how fast the song is. So it seems like it's harder for birds to sing really fast, and faster is probably better from the receiving bird's perspective. Amazing. That was such a thorough and clear uh, explanation for song type matching and your theory on structural alignability. Thank you. And I, that was five questions, and I know we've come to the end, but I was wondering if we had time for one more. Um, I wanted to ask you, how do field seasons usually work for you? I know you talked about uh, going to Puerto Rico and really enjoying yourself on your uh, field sites and your experiments. How is it at all affected by COVID and the state of the world, uh, if at all? And um, yeah, that'll be my last question. Today. Yes, it is definitely, definitely affected by COVID. Um, you know, I, so I, uh, as a birdsong researcher, I know a lot of birdsong researchers. I'm friends with a lot of birdsong researchers. We, we, we talk on, on Facebook and, and email and stuff. And almost everybody I know has canceled their field season. Almost everybody's canceled their field season. I, I, can't, I can't fly to Puerto Rico. Uh, I can't let my students fly to Puerto Rico. Uh, it's, against, um, it's against federal policy. It's impractical, it's unethical. Yeah, we just can't do it. So I can't go to my field site in Puerto Rico uh, and conduct field work. And, and my plan was to do that uh, this past April. Uh, my graduate student, Juliska Vasquez Cardona and I were gonna go to Puerto Rico to do her field experiment for her master's. And we just didn't go. We had all the preparation, we bought a lot of stuff. We ended up um, you know, using our insurance policy on the plane tickets and the whole bit. So. For all that, whatever it was, 100 hours of work that we put in to sort of set it up, another 50 hours of work to, to sort of dissolve it, and that's that. And, and yeah, that's, you know, there's nothing, right? Um, she was super cool about it. She really understood, which was great, um, that there was just, you know, no getting around it, and she's been very accepting. Uh, she's going to be fine. We've got tons of data already. One really cool thing about field research on birdsong is that you get a huge amount of data. Uh, the birds sing a lot, and we have hours and hours and hours of recordings and, and just just gigabytes of data at this point, just vast amounts of data. So we're doing great. That actually might be a lie, it might not be gigabytes, but it's a lot of data anyway. So we're doing fine. Um, I, think, I think there's other people that have it a lot worse. I think there's other people who had very field-based uh, graduate degrees. They're gonna have a really hard time. Uh, they're probably gonna need to extend their programs a fair bit, but um, for us, we're gonna be fine. I'm just happy everybody's safe. And, uh, and we're looking forward to getting back to Puerto Rico as soon as we're able, checking in on our birds, and, uh, and continuing our work there. Yeah, amazing, thank you. I'm glad you're able to proceed with the data that you have and hope you're able to get back to Puerto Rico soon also uh, to visit your, 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 your birds. Do you have a favorite bird? I definitely did have a favorite bird in my PhD project. First bird I caught, I was quite fond of. And then I'd have like, there was a lot of variation among the territories and in Panama where I was doing my PhD, the mosquitoes and the undergrowth and the snakes and everything were bad enough that I liked the birds that had territories that I could walk around on without getting cut and scraped and stuff more. Uh, right now, I don't know if I have a favorite bird, but it's almost like, it's almost like when you ask the first question, I, I, I kind of feel differently about different birds. Like I, I impart personalities on the different birds. Just a little, like not too much, but you know, there's one that we call the family man because he always has a big, he always has lots of kids and he's always very active, kind of like, you know, patrolling the territory and stuff and helping his wife with the kids. So I kind of like imagine him to be like a good guy, like a hardworking, 
good guy who takes care of his family. <laughs> you know, and then there's this one that we call Brian and he's, he's single and he just sings all day, all day, all day. And he's got this little territory that's not very good, but he just sings constantly. And so me and the graduate students kind of imagine him as this kind of loser who's just like always desperately trying to, to attract a female, but isn't able to do it because he's kind of a, just, you know, something wrong with this bird, something wrong with his territory or something. So I, I guess, I don't know if I have a favorite, but I do see some of them as, as individuals. Thank you so much for allowing us to see the birds through your eyes and through your wisdom. Uh, thank you, David Logue, for, uh, for the interview, for the opportunity to, to, to share this space with you um, and for the audience for tuning in. And uh, I hope you are also able to adjust uh, during, this, uh, during this time and that we've been able to provide some type of um, some type of uh, useful information to you in this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Uriel. Uh, I had a really good time and I'm, I'm again really happy you agreed to do this. Uh, it was a lot of fun preparing for this and, and doing it with you. Um, thanks again to Catherine Reeder for producing this and all the hard work that went into that and, and thank you, the audience, uh, for taking the time to check this out. <laughs>